Reach up, take a deep breath. That way when you fall asleep, you'll be more relaxed. All right, thank you. <laughs> I'm going to surprise you. I don't, I'm not that geeky. I'm not going to do that many details. And the way I want to present this is I've been shown over and over and over that in any room that I'm in where I'm talking, whatever subject I'm talking about, there's somebody in the room that knows more about it than me. So please, if you know more about something that I'm saying, um, interrupt me and, and correct. You know, this, is, this is for everybody. This is not for my ego. So if I'm saying something that's not, that you know is not correct, please jump in. The main point of what I'm, what I'm looking to talk about here is indoor air quality and how it relates to the, to the code and specifically for multifamily. A lot of you are really interested in commercial buildings. Some of you are really interested in, in single family. Um, I'm going to fall asleep on that. I don't give a flying fig about those. Uh, for me, it's about multifamily. Um, and, and those of you that know me for a while know that that's, that's a drum I've been beating for a long time. So we, we're going to kind of look at what has the code done for indoor air quality and what has the code done to indoor air quality um, and how well does that work for multifamily and can we expect Title 24 to create good indoor air quality for multifamily in 2020? Next slide. So long historical perspective, American homes took many forms um, over, over the time before the Europeans got here. And they, they did not really have much of an indoor air quality problem, um, usually. And, and that's for a couple of reasons. It, you know, we didn't, have a, we didn't have a bunch of petroleum-based products going into the homes that, that people lived in before about four or 500 years ago in America. And they spent a lot of the time outdoors. They weren't, you know, they weren't inside most of the time, except for cooking or when, you know, when the weather required it. So here's a, the next slide um, is, it shows a picture of some of the, the kinds of Native American housing. And you can see, you know, there was, there was really a lot of ventilation through <laughs> leaks, right? And the next slide shows a dry climate uh, situation, same sort of thing. You know, it was pretty open. So more recent history. Um, IAQ actually had been a large topic in the 1800s, and there was just an awful lot of work done on, on you know, figuring out why, you know, what is it about buildings that makes people sick. The thinking changed an awful lot. It was um, at one point considered that it was just about dryness, and, and then another point it was just about coolness. Another point it was about all of the, the, the crap that we breathe out. In other words, we were the only source of bad air quality inside the building. And then some seminal work was done um, in, the, in the 1930s on it, too. But then in, in 1962, Rachel Carson changed the whole idea about what environmentalism is, and we forgot about indoor quality, because you know, what's happening outdoors was really important. We were, we were, losing, we were losing birds left and right. Um, and you know, there's a lot of things. So the indoor air quality was no longer an environmental issue for a while. And then we had this, these energy crises, um, which in California, fostered the creation of the California Energy Commission and the first um, building energy efficiency codes in the world, the first appliance efficiency codes in the world. But still, we, pardon? Uh, it was the 70s. The first price was the 73, the second was? 76? 79. 79, okay. But the Energy Commission um, was, was founded in John 75, 75. And, and we had the first code in 78, uh, which everybody ignored, and we had the first code that people actually paid attention to. I was a builder up here at the time, and I, I remember, you know, it's the 1980s, everything's changing. Well, wait a minute, we've had a code for two years. But actually, an interesting point is the first code was actually was based on a passive home. It was the, what, the, uh, the Siri, um, the, it's now NREL, Solar Energy Research Institute, Institute. Um, and that and they they you know, it was it was a passive home, and that was that was the code. Um, obviously, the builders didn't like it, and that's why we had a new code. So, the forty-year history then. So, we've had this increased focus on energy efficiency with the building codes, and um, we have resulted in tighter homes, and. You know, how many of you remember people saying, well, all of this sick building stuff is because of the energy codes, right? That, that's what, that was the message. It was, 
Well, the code's making it make the buildings tight and now people are getting sick. Well, it was simply a matter of all of that crap was in the homes before, but the homes were leaky enough, you didn't have to worry about it because fresh air just kept coming in. And then we, we started tightening them up. So let's go down to the next slide. I'll put my glasses on and tell you which slide that is. Eight. Um, I'm not going to read this for you, but this is a good example of, of the, the thinking at the time, is that our, our buildings, all these things in our buildings um, uh, and, and our code, were, were making us sick. You know, we're causing mold and mildew and all that. And, and it was, again, largely blamed on the code. Uh, next slide. So we saw that there was a, a need to reduce energy while um, protecting health. And um, I had the good fortune of being at the Energy Commission at the time that the first time we had to do an uh, environmental impact review on the next iteration of the code. This was the 92 code. Um, and before that, it was like nobody thought about it. But then we started taking a look at that, and that's when you started seeing much more focus on the, in the energy code on indoor air quality and, and ventilation and uh, building heights. And now what we've come to is you know, the mantra that, that probably everybody in the room knows, build tight, ventilate right. Um, and you know, that, that has two pieces to it. And you can't have a tight building unless you ventilate right, but yet, guess what? You can't ventilate right unless you have a tight building. I mean, the two things go together completely. So are we sending the right, go to the next slide. Are we sending the right message for multifamily building? The right message, well, go to the next slide, there's the answer. We're not, and, and, and we haven't been, and, um, and for those of you that want to hold your breath until we do, it ain't gonna happen in 2020. We're gonna make move, movement towards it, probably, hopefully, um, depending upon funding by all of the utilities and, uh, and that kind of work. But it still is not going to be right. Go ahead to the next slide. So there's this issue on indoor quality and air leakage about single family versus multifamily versus non res So we have, you know, in, in, in the, the iteration, we, you know, we, had, we only had ASHRAE 62 initially, and that was about good indoor air quality across the board, period. Well, then they naturally started looking at homes differently than commercial buildings, and we had 61.1 for commercial buildings, 61.2 for uh, residential buildings. And residential buildings was single-family homes, right? But then they got applied to multifamily, unless they were really tall. Well, and then, the, then they were non-residential buildings. So it was... Nobody has, has, has had a, a clear perspective on this, much less building officials. And I can say this, because I used to be one, uh, building officials are a fairly easy lot to confuse. And if you, if you make an attempt to do it, you're done. But if you don't make an attempt not to, you're still going to confuse building officials. And I mean, you think about most of, the, most of the guys that worked for me when I was chief building official were either retired contractor a failed contractor, or somebody whose uh, the industry they were in went belly up and they had to go back to school and get trained to do something, and oh, this looks interesting, so I'll do that. Well, yesterday I couldn't spell inspector, today I are one. <laughs> and then the fact that a minority actually went to school to become that. And, and that year, the chief building inspector uh, in Humboldt County now is a good example of that, Todd Sabala. He went to school to become a, a, an inspector and learn all about it, and that's but they're rare. So, you know, you, you need we need to have uh, something that makes sense to somebody who's been banging nails most of their lives. So, with all of that, and, and including Calgene, multifamily was an afterthought. Nobody went out and said, Hey, let's figure out how to do this right for multifamilies, let's figure out how to do it right for single family homes, let's figure out how to do it right for, for uh, commercial buildings, and then let's see how we can apply that to multifamily. And that's been the, the tradition all along. Just to give you another perspective on that, um, we had the first standards in California in 1978, first residential standards. The very first time that the Energy Commission looked seriously at how a, a, a measures work for multifamily specifically was in the 2005 code. 2005, so 78 to 2005, hey, it works for residential, right? The look, the review was all done for single family. And I'm partly guilty for that. I'm, you know, I was, I was there working on that. So um, what's the answer for multifamily? And the answer is compartmentalization. When we think about a single family building, 
We're worried about the air that might come out of the garage because it might be contaminated by exhaust or paint that's stored there in the garage or all that other crap. And the air that might be coming from the sub-area because it might be moist and have radon in it, et cetera. With a multifamily building, if we're concerned about the health issues, we're concerned about what the neighbor on this side is smoking and what the neighbor on this side is brewing in his kitchen, whether it be crack or onions, you know. There's a lot of, well, really, I mean, it happens. And so it's not about the outside air. If you think about how much exterior wall there is for an apartment compared to the square footage of that apartment, and then take a look at that versus the single family home, the wall area versus the floor, the wall area for an apartment is not where you need to be worried about it. That's not where your main losses are going to be. It's not where your leakage is going to be. It's going to be through the hole underneath the sink that your plumbing comes in that, by the way, connects to the next apartment. And when you have a negative pressure in your apartment, you're sucking whatever is from their bathroom into yours. So what matters most? So the pollutants in the outdoor air or the pollutants from your neighbor's apartment? Depends where you live. Exactly. It depends. You can tell that I used to be a bureaucrat because that is the answer. It depends. One of these pictures is next to a shipyard. If that's where your apartment is, then you better be paying attention to keeping that outdoor air out of there or filtering it really well. But if you're not, if that's not the environment that you're in, you're in an area where the air is a lot cleaner, well then you've got to be worrying about the neighbor next door that's, you know, the bottom picture is cooking crack in their bathtub or the top picture is smoking something. So the recent addition of ASHRAE 62.2 has now made it applicable to all multifamily dwellings. So instead of having, you know, once you get above three floors, now we're going to apply 62.1. It's now 62.2 applies to all the money. What that comes down to is that compartmentalization. Now, it's great that we move forward to say, okay, well, we need to take a look at this apartment as being separate from everything else, not just separate from the outside. But what do they do to verify it? They say, well, here's one way you can verify it. And in the backup writings, you see, well, yeah, but that's not cost effective, and nobody's going to do that. And then there's no other way listed. So it's really, it's really, it's really a, a paper uh, improvement. It's not really, it hasn't really fixed things. So what is the, what's the consensus? Well, there isn't any, unfortunately. There's, there's some really good work that was done recently in Building America um, by Joe Stieberg. I think I have it on one of the slides. No, I'm, maybe I don't. Um, that kind of outlines what the, what the possibilities are. Um, that, and Gwellen has done some work on this. The possibilities... Um, I don't want to go through all the possibilities because there's a lot of them. Um, none of them are perfect. None of them are exactly the right way to do it. I mean, do you do you want to put a blower door on, on the whole building? Hey, that's cost effective. We can figure that out, period, and end of discussion. Or do you want to put a blower door on each apartment to figure out the leakage in that apartment? Um, and if you do that, well, then do you make sure that every other window and, and door in the whole building is shut or make sure that it's open or you put a fan, a blower door on, on, on every build apartment that could have connection to that apartment that you're testing. And, and that's even illusory. If you're, you know, you've got a three-story apartment building, you're looking at an apartment on the top floor, are you going to assume that there's not a connection down through the wall to those apartments on the first floor? So there's no consensus on how to do it yet. And the other thing is we focus on prescriptive requirements for air leakage and a prescriptive requirement for ventilation, air, air exchangers. Can builders meet those two requirements and you still have bad air quality in your apartments? Yes. You can meet the two requirements, and you still have not given what we have had those requirements for, which is good indoor air quality. Uh, next slide, which is Ed been telling you, uh, is 16. So is it too hard to figure out how to do this right? Um, it is hard. It's hard to figure out the correct threshold. There's a lot of disagreement about you know, what level of this pollutant or what level of that pollutant is acceptable. It's expensive. 
to test for every one of the criteria of pollutants. And even if it weren't, the test results would only be for that moment that you're doing the test. And do people bring stuff into the apartment once they move in? No, of course not. No. <laughs> they live in an apartment just as, it, as, as you hand them the keys and it's done, right? Um, and, and some materials just keep on emitting. There are some materials that, that the rate of emission actually goes up in, over time instead of going down. So, you know, it's hard, right? Um, so, you know, here's a, a, on the next slide, you see an example of, of trying to get to consensus on what are the right, and this is just, this is just CO2. This is one of the easy ones to try and figure out and, and test for. And you'll see that there's no agreement. Even if you take one of these, it's complicated because, um, well, how long is the exposure? We're talking about you know, momentarily, we're talking about, you know, for a day. So, how hard is it? A um, couple quotes here. Um, John F. Kennedy, we choose to go to the moon in this decade and do those other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. I scratched my head over that for a long time. Uh, I mean, how many things do you do just because they're hard? Um, but when the idea is it needs to be done, nobody else is going to do it, that's a good reason, you know, then that's a good time to do it because it's hard. And then here's a quote from this other guy, uh, when in doubt, do the right thing, even if it's hard. Yeah. So. It's my hope um, and my intent to the, to the degree I can get funding to, uh, to make it happen that the 2019 standards or 2020 standards, whichever you call it, will take steps towards ensuring good indoor air quality. I have no illusions that it won't be more than just steps towards that. In other words, we ain't, ain't going to get there um, by 2020. It's, it's not going to happen. But we can move that direction and make things better. I saw a hand. Yeah, I, uh, I'm not done. And maybe this is uh, premature, but is one of those steps balanced ventilation? That's a raging debate. There's people who've done the master's thesis to say balanced ventilation is, is hooey because it's never balanced. Um, you always have a, you're always creating a negative pressure or a positive pressure. Um, there's other people that say that's the only way to get there. Um, if you're a builder, well, hey, it's all exhaust ventilation because that's cost effective. You know, go back to Kurt Vonnegut. I, I don't think that that's really the big issue. The big issue, I think, is controlling your ventilation for the level of pollutants. I mean, we, we all have thermostats on the wall, right? We control the temperature within a range that we want. How hard is it in this day of, of all of these engineering geeks that, that can figure out how to, to measure and control everything? How hard would it be to have something else on the wall that, that controls ventilation based on the levels of CO2, CO, VOCs, moisture. It doesn't seem like it'd be that hard. There are some controls out there that go most of the way. I haven't seen any that go all the way there, but there's some controls that go up that most of it. There's a lot of advertising, too, that, that makes it look like the you know, complete uh, IAQ control, but actually all they're really controlling for is humidity. And one of the slides here, I've got pictures of some of those. The last one, last slide. And then I've got resources here. We have rental properties and occupancy law has a lot to do with what you're talking about too. You look at how many rooms you have and how many people are allowed in the hall, which is appropriate. So we're seeing that in our rental properties. Right. And there's a lot of cultural differences too. My wife's Mexican American. We have a big pot of beans on the stove at least once a week. Um, and that puts an awful lot of moisture in the air. Um, I mean, there's, there's a lot of differences. Everybody, everybody's different. And so we're trying to have this one prescriptive standard of you know, your building can't leak any more than this, and you have to have this ventilation rate. We're not solving the problem. What we're doing is we're making ourselves feel good that we, you know, we did something. Yes? Is Europe ahead or behind us on the ventilation issues the multifamily? I was just traveling there last year, and they had a lot of the small liberal build users throughout instead of just a thousand ventilator. Can you speak to that? I can't. Um, I've never been to Europe. Well, I, but I think I want to just add that it would be lovely to discuss this a little bit later. We've got a trial going on with Mia early to mid next year on a multi family project where we're putting in balanced ventilation. Uh -huh. And these are very small units, like you know, 600 square feet and down, because up there that's kind of all the rage. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're departing from 62 to, we're gonna, we're gonna design in the way that we can adjust the fan speed at maximum, um, we'll hit 62 to, and then in 
operation, we're gonna we're gonna bring it back down and try to hit a an area exchange rate of point three two. So, and then start bringing that down while the occupants are in it, and see where the CO two starts monitoring, which is different with the occupant load, you know. And and so it can be really interesting in these very different in these little six hundred square foot. Where you know, I mean, you can only adjust the load so much, right? Because you got some volume, there, so it's kind of a wall to bump into. But um, so far in in Europe, where we draw a lot of this knowledge, is you know, balanced ventilation. If it's really there, even with operable windows and all of that, it really solves the issue of pressurization through the corridor and really getting a mix. And it solves the room to room issue because if it's balanced. You know, there's no reason to force things from one unit into another. So, and, and no masters. Here's one of the concerns I have about it. As soon as one of your neighbors opens a window, it's no longer it's balanced. balanced. Right. Well, well, it yeah. is balanced, right? Only, unless only unless the window's got a big old piece of wind on it, right? But if, if there's no air movement through the window, it's still balanced. You're, that unit's balanced. That's a big if. Well, it, actually, it's not. So Nia just did a two-year study on balanced ventilation of the Northwest. It's already written and published. Um, and the balanced ventilation worked beautifully um, with windows open and windows closed and various occupant loads and things like that. Um, because, you know, the balanced ventilation is one stream's going out, one stream's coming in by force. If you puncture the envelope anywhere, unless that puncture provides pressure, if, if it doesn't provide pressure, like, you know, on a really windy day, it's either going to suck it out or it's going to push it in, right? So that'll skew it for a while, but they're probably not going to open the window so much on a really windy day. Mostly it'll be kind of the calm days where they want to get that feeling. So generally, overall, and over the course of a period, it, it really works quite Nicely. As I said, there's some pretty strong proponents of, of balanced ventilation, and, and, and you know, quite honestly, my clinic is fly ventilation, and with really good filtration on it, and then it controls on it. And that was like positive pressure. Yeah, create positive pressure, and, and as long as it's compartmentalized. I'm sorry? But not extreme not extreme. Like, no. Bracketing it is important. You can have things like any laboratory clean room design, varying degrees of positive pressure away from the air station, but you get to the negative pressure and you're not putting those mechanics into the outside area that you control. So there's plenty of ways. How many CFM are you talking about? I didn't CFM, it's pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you said it's it, I mean, it depends how large it depends how large your apartment is. But you know, here's the thing. If you've compartmentalized correctly and you have a supply of ventilation, then it doesn't matter where it's going. You don't have to have anything that sucks it out. Pressure is not going to get outrageously high in the apartment. You know, tests have been done on this. It's not. So it's going to go to the outside. You're going to get rid of it. If you've compartmentalized, you don't want to, you don't want to have just supply ventilation if you're not making sure that you're not pushing your stuff into your neighbor's place. And, and I mean, anybody who's been to DPI training can pretty quickly tell you as well that having, and maintaining a slight negative pressure in your combustion appliance zone would be something that we consider along with that proper pressure design. So because we started about an hour late, we should transition. And yeah. not because the yeah. talk isn't important, yeah. but yeah. You know. Well done. And the conversation will come up more than once. We have more indoor air quality sessions on HVAC. And so next, let's see here. We have, in an ideal world, we'd have Ann Edminster come up next. Oh, you're ideal. Are you ready for this? Well, is it, is it an ideal world or not? <laughs> well, this is as nice as I can arrange. So, would you guys like to do a stand up and stretch kind of thing? Yeah.